The following is a message from Crossroads Church, a grace-centered community in central Alberta, Canada. Well, good morning, church. You're there. I have one more announcement. I think Jordan had enough to to talk about. So I want to just uh, remind you that today, actually, our small, small groups catalog came out. So in here, if you're not used to this yet, this is the second time we've tried this. Uh, in here is a whole list of different kinds of small groups that are available, and they run for about 12 weeks. And they're all starting at the same time, so everybody's new, and uh, you don't have to feel like you're breaking into a group of people. And so what we want you to do is take a look at the catalog. You can find it online, you can find it on our mobile app, or you can pick one up in the foyer. They're scattered throughout the place. And in there, there's over different, 60 different kinds of groups that you could try to find one that you would connect with, that you would enjoy. There's connecting groups and growth groups and service groups and hope groups. And we're really hoping that people will find a place where they can plug in, they get connected, get to know some people. It'll really change your experience of church Sunday morning. If you can come here and you recognize faces and people know your name. And so I know how hard that can be coming here uh, to get to know people. So find a place to plug in. And we uh, look forward to what God's going to do through the groups this next semester. So make sure you take a look at that. In three weeks, we're going to kind of say, you got to have decided by now. So you kind of start and get three Sundays to, to take your time and, and pray about it. But after that, we need you to sign up and get going so they can all start off around the same time. Let's open in a word of prayer as we look at God's word together. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your presence today. I thank you that you're a living God and that your word's living and it brings life to those who listen. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we engage with you today, as we read your word, that you would encounter us in a fresh and new way, that we would hear from you and not just hear, but that we would allow your word and who you are to penetrate into our being in such a way that it would change us to the core. Heavenly Father, our dream is that we would be a community of people that are following you, dramatically affected by who you are. That we would change central Alberta because you first changed us. Heavenly Father, would you be glorified and honored today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to... We're going to look for a couple of weeks together here at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 is a a place where Jesus tells a few different parables. And it it has dramatically affected me at different times in my life. And again, about six months ago, it was a passage that came to my attention. And as pastors, we've been been wrestling. We've been wrestling with God that he He would speak to us about... Crossroads Church and and what it is that we need to be doing different that we would be radically changed to give life to our community. And we believe God is asking us as pastors, as staff here, to first start with ourselves and to reflect upon His presence in our own life. And so when I when I talk this morning about about you and, and how you're being affected, I want you to know that we're in the same boat, that that I'm in the same process, that we've got the same challenge, whether you're, you're, you're staff or you're just visiting here or you're a regular attender or you're serving, that we all have to be challenged in the same way. This isn't just for some and not for others. And so Jesus, he, he starts off in this passage by using words like listen and pay attention. In fact, as you go through the, the chapter, you'll... You'll see many times, and I want you to be, be able to recognize them and even circle them in your own Bible. Every time you hear a word like, pay attention, listen, listen, heed my words, uh, apply what I'm saying, gain understanding. Those kind of words, because they're, they're very important that we understand what Jesus is trying to say to us. Now, I've learned about myself. I am not the best listener. I'm not the poster child for listening, that's for sure. And I've been reminded by my wife several times this week that I don't listen well. And I'm not listening. And she knows I'm not listening. Because she'll come to me a little while later and ask what I've done about what she told me. And I'll often reply, what are you talking about? I didn't remember that conversation. And so she knows that. And I know it's about my kids too. Because 
we'll tell them and we'll give them a list of things to do and we'll, we'll ask them, this is what you need to do before supper or before bedtime or before this or before you can go out. And, and they'll look at us and they'll nod their head and then they'll walk away and then later we'll ask them about it. And they didn't even remember the conversation ever happening. And so I realized that a lot of us have a problem with listening. We're not very good listeners at all, actually. We're pretty good at talking and, and a society has figured that out. And so we got things like Twitter and Facebook where we can talk and talk and talk and no one actually, it doesn't really matter if they're listening. Um, sometimes we wonder, I mean, we, we say things and then there's just silence. And so you get the odd person who kind of like says, so if you like what I said, you know, like it or something. So I know people are listening because we're so used to talking and just putting it out there. And I'm reminded that, you know, parents and, and teachers who've often said to me growing up, you know, Sean, you have two ears and one mouth, so try listening twice as much as you're talking. But now I get a mic, so they can't, can't shut me up. I, I'm one of those guys, though, that, you know, has always liked the weird stuff and the obscure stuff, and I'll get on little tangents, and, and I'll decide I'm interested in something because it's different. And, and often this has come into our pet realm, and I've kind of mentioned that a few times. And, and, but it's also come in different areas, and even into the area of gardening. I'm not, I'm not really into gardening, but I like the unique stuff, like the peppers that you have to wear goggles and hands with to even grow. Those ones, like, I tried to get a hold of some of those seeds, and, and I couldn't. Um, but there's different things like that have gotten my interest. And, and I came across once these things called the gigantic pumpkin. And they're grown a lot near Utah, but they're grown everywhere. And they're giant pumpkins. And these things are, are massive. And so they caught my eye. And I, and I looked into them a little bit about what a giant pumpkin really is like. And I found out that the largest pumpkin, and this is the record is in the last couple of years here, is over 1,818 pounds. And so these are rather big pumpkins. When you look at the Canadian record, here's the pumpkin that has the Canadian record right now. It's 1,677 pounds. And so we can grow them here as well. And that really got my mind thinking as well. So I started looking into the details about it and it got intrigued me more and more. It only takes four months or about 110 to 130 days to actually grow one of these. And so if you look at the size of the pumpkin, you start realizing what kind of speed of growth these things actually have in their DNA. It's amazing. In fact, they grow about 30 pounds a day. They can go up to 60 pounds in 24 hours. That means they have to drink over 100 gallons of water. It's amazing. It was really intriguing to me. So I approached my wife once about our little area of flower beds because we don't really have a garden (laughs) and I kind of bidded for a corner and to be honest she was pretty excited that it wasn't another alligator this time so I just said I just want to grow a pumpkin and so she gave me the little corner area to grow the pumpkin but I I wanted to grow you know not just an ordinary pumpkin that's boring so I thought how could I grow a big pumpkin because you know, people were growing okay-sized pumpkins in our church, and this one guy was really good at it. So I approached him, and I said, if I was going to grow an enormous pumpkin, what would I need to do? And he said, well, you got to get special seeds. Like, they don't sell those around here. And, and so I, I pushed him, you know, can you get me a seed? Can you hook me up? And, and what I found out was that when you break records, you actually become like a breeder of pumpkins and you sell your seeds. So that pumpkin would be cut open eventually and they would extract those seeds and sell them because they're worth some pretty good money. So I remember the day when he came to me up at church and he handed me two seeds. He's like, these are the genetic code, the record holders of pumpkins. And I was just like, just jazzed. So he's like, you only need one to grow. So I gave you two, but if two grow, you got to take one out because you only have room for one of these things. I'm like, perfect. So I take it home and, and I, I throw it in the corner of our little, you know, garden there and the leaves start growing and the leaves start spreading out and, and I start having dreams at night about sitting next to my massive pumpkin. <laughs> and, and I learned things about pumpkins that you don't even want to hear about, like how you sex pumpkins and and help them actually it's weird so i i wasn't really interested in that because to be honest i didn't really need a pumpkin to go that big i just wanted some pretty big pumpkins for my kids to be impressed with 
So I thought, I'll just throw the seed in, and surely with the genetics that that seed contains, I'll get some pretty decent pumpkins. So I waited, and I watched the leaves grow, and they spread, and they tried to trickle into my wife's garden, and she would cut them off and, and try to hold this thing back. And, and I kept looking and looking and looking for this pumpkin, and I, I was so disappointed. I could not find a pumpkin. Apparently, I don't know how to make them um, have intimacy very well or something. So I was very frustrated. And so at the end of the season, you know, I had to cut down all these leaves because they were huge and growing all over. And as I was doing that, I finally actually found my pumpkin. (laughs) That's my pumpkin. I took a picture of it next to a golf ball so you'd really get the idea of what I had accomplished. I was very disappointed. Actually, last night I looked up World Canadian Records of like the smallest pumpkin, and that is smaller. It's just I don't think there's a real competition for it. So I should have hung on to it, but I didn't. So that was my pumpkin. And, and I went back to the website. You know, you go to these websites and you try to learn about this, and it, it says this, and I, I cut it out and I made sure I get it right. This is word for word. It says, there's an old saying, to be a successful gardener, grow pumpkins. So, of course, I, that's what I want to do. With this truth, you only need one thing to produce pumpkins. Colon. Seeds. They lied. Absolutely garbage. It's not true. It's not the only thing you need. Of course, with my distracted, you know, personality, that's all I read. I went back to it later and found out it says, surely there's more than just placing seeds in the ground. And then it goes on to explain all the hard work of soil preparation. The fact that you can't just take a seed, no matter how genetically wired it is to be a gigantic pumpkin, and you can't just throw it in the corner of any garden, in the corner of any kind of soil, and expect it to produce the fruit that you want it to. It takes preparation. It takes a certain kind of soil with a certain kind of ingredients to produce the fruit that you want to get. And so, looking at Mark chapter 4, Jesus talks about this concept. He talks about the concept of of seeds and soil. And so we're going to look at his understanding, his insider scoop on dirt and what it's really about. So Mark chapter 4, he starts again with these words. I want you to listen, pay attention, take heed. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering some seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and they ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, so it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. While other seed, it fell among thorns, which grew up, and it choked the plants. And so they did not bear any kind of grain or fruit. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up, and it grew, and it produced a crop of 30, 60, or even a 100 times as much as was sown. Then Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I like to pick the parables that Jesus explains, because then I can't really mess it up. So later, the disciples are, are been listening to parables and listening to Jesus teach. And, and this is the one that he said you need to pay attention to and you need to listen to. So they, they come to him and they say, can you go back, go back to that parable about scattering of the seeds and the soils and can you explain it to us? And so Jesus said to them, don't you understand the parable? How, how are you going to understand any of the parables I tell if you can't get this one? See, this one's important. This one is talking about what I'm doing, what I'm about, what we're doing. You're following me around. This parable explains our mission, what we're trying to accomplish. You need to understand this. You need to understand what we're about and what we're trying to do. And you need to be able to understand what to expect as we go. And so he explains it to them. And he says this, the farmer sows the word. And some people that we're going to be talking to, some people, they're going to be like seed along the path where the word is sown, the word is spoken to them. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. 
Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, they're going to hear my message. They're going to hear what I have to say. And at once, they're going to receive it with joy. But since they don't have any kind of root, they're only going to last a short time. When the trouble comes or persecution comes because of the word, then they're going to quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among the thorns, they're going to, they're going to hear my message. They're going to hear me. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and desires for making other things come in and they, they choke them out. Other seed sown on good soil are going to hear me. They're going to accept me. And they're going to produce a crop 30 or 60 or 100 times what was sown. And so as you read this parable, you can't help but notice that there's, there's definitely two things that need to be there. It's not just the seed that needs to be good. It's not just the seed that needs the genetics in it. It's not just the message. It's not the gospel itself. It's also the preparation that has been made for the soil. And so you need good seed and you need good soil. And those two together, when they, when they combine and they interact with each other, they will produce fruit. And so there's two things that need to happen. And I want to talk first about the seed really quick. I want you to understand what Jesus is trying to say about the seed and what the seed actually is. The seed is the word of God. And for, for us, sometimes when we read this passage of scripture, we read stuff like this. We, we start thinking of um, a great sermon or, or uh, you know, a picture with a verse on it. And, and we think of the text itself and we think that is what the word is. And so when I hear a sermon or I'm at a Bible study or I'm doing my devotions, when I read something, then that's the seed. And I want you to know something today. That seed is far more than that. The word is logos. The word is the word. When the word approaches your life, when the word comes to you, the word is Jesus. The word is the person of who he is. The word is the gospel message. It is the one who is sent from God with the message that he no longer condemns the world, but is willing to forgive us and accept us into his family. It's far more than a verse. It's far more than a script. It's far more than just words that we know of. In John chapter 1 verses 1 to 5, it gives you a picture of the same word, what he's talking about when he says the word comes. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was God in the beginning. He, it's a person. The word is a person. It is God himself, God in the flesh that is being sown in our lives. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. In him was life. And that life was the light of mankind. In the word of Jesus, in himself, in his person, is the life of It's the light of life. It shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. And sometimes we just make the word so small. And we don't understand really what the word is. In fact, Jesus even said this about those who were religious in his day. He said to them, you study scriptures... Because you think by the scriptures, that by reading the scriptures, that you will possess eternal life. But these are scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to get life. Jesus says, don't confuse the two. Don't confuse the two. You can have an intellectual grasp on the Bible. You can know your Greek. You can know your Hebrew. You can be the the quizzing champion of Canada. You can be able to do sword drills and find verses at the drop of a hat. You can do all kinds of things. But that in itself does not bring about life. Don't miss the word. God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. He is the one that brings about fruit. It's not doing your devotions. It's not reading your daily bread every day that brings about fruit. It is encountering the person of Jesus Christ. 
Well, Jesus continues on in the passage right after this parable, and he jumps into another parable. And I, I can't read the whole chapter for you. So I just, I didn't put it all in there, but I'm going to read this part for you. And Because this whole chapter of Mark all intertwines together, and it all fits together very, very well. And so Mark 4, he continues in verse 21, and right after this he says, Then Jesus said to them, Would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket? Or hide it under the bed? Now he's talking about a candle. That he's, it's, just, it's just crazy. You don't take a flame and then hide it under your bed. But it's actually translated not very accurately in the scriptures that we can see because it's hard for us to get our head around this. And so it says, it doesn't say, and most of our, our Bibles translate it, when someone brings the light. But Jesus is saying, when the light comes. But that's a, that's, a, that's a person word. And that's exactly what it's used in the Greek. It says, when the light comes, when Jesus comes into the room, when Jesus shows up into your life, it would be crazy to hide him in the corner, to put him under the bed, to put him under a bowl, to segregate him, to push him off to the side, to have him in just one area. That's not what he says you do with it. Because when the light comes, when the lamp comes, it is to be placed on the stand. The stand is brought, it's higher, it's in the room, so that everything is lit up, everything is exposed. He says, for everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open by the light. Every secret will be brought in. Anyone, he says again, with ears to hear, let him hear. And then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen to me, the more understanding you're going to be given. And you will receive even more. To those who listen to my teaching, he says again, more understanding is going to be given. But those who are not listening, those who are not heeding the word, those who are not paying attention to me, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. And so for the seed that's sown on the path, for those that are not willing to take heed, for not willing to listen, it will be taken away. Jesus is the Word. He is the light. This isn't just a, a talk about how do we interact with the text. This parable is about how does the living Word of God, the person of Jesus Christ, penetrate into our lives? Does it penetrate? Does it produce fruit? Does it produce life? The seed that finds good soil will produce a great Crop. Jesus says you need to pay attention to what we hear. And so, sometimes we think listening is so passive. It's such a passive act that he's talking about. But it's not passive. That's why Jesus calls out, pay attention, get it, understand it, pay attention, pay attention. It's not, act, it's not passive. I want you to be active with me. I want you to engage with me. I want you to understand what I'm doing and what I'm saying and who I am. I want you to engage what I'm doing. So it's important that you know that in that day and time when you, when you sowed seed and you would, you would take it and you would throw it around. And some would land on the path because the path is there for harvest as well. And it was a, it was a path that they would walk on. And when I was in Africa, I saw these, these fields and there was paths and, and they would scatter the seed. But once the seed is on top, they're different than what we do today. Is then they would plow the seed in. First you scatter it on the top, and then you would plow it underneath. So you don't plow in the path because you need the path. So that seed would be wasted. But you could decide how deep that seed needs to go in. How far was I going to allow it to penetrate? And so this is an active processing of listening. This is taking the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and deciding how far am I going to plow Him into my life. So the first soil that we're not going to spend a long time dealing with, it's just the unreceptive soil. It's where no intention is being made whatsoever to take it, to learn from it, to heed it, to put it into your life. 
And Jesus said, there's going to be people like that, that I'm going to talk to, that I'm going to share, that they're going to experience me, but have absolutely no desire to make me a part of their life. They're not going to engage me. And so I want to look at the second soil in a little more depth, and next week we're going to cover the other two. The second soil is the, the shallow soil. And, and you, can, you can nickname it if you want, the fan. The fan of Jesus. The, the enthusiastic, the whoop it up, get excited about Jesus person. Because he says, these are the people that represent, when they hear me, when they encounter me for the first time, they just, they get excited. They're happy. They're, they're full of joy. They're thinking about what this could mean for their life, how this is going to work out. And, and it's like, I found the key. I, I found the answer now. I can enjoy life. I, I can, I figured it out with Jesus. I can now make my life work. And, and it's so easy to get caught up in that. Jesus is going to make my life work. And he becomes a part of this shallow level of our life. Well, Jesus always has had lots of fans. Um, he still has fans. In fact, you wonder if, if Jesus had a Facebook page, how many friends would he have? I got news for you. He has a Facebook page. He has a couple of them, actually. And in one of his Facebook pages that he has, he has over 10 million friends. And in the other one I saw, he has over 3 million and 800,000 friends with lots of people who like him. Our society is still a fan of Jesus. The number one selling book of all time is still the Bible. Number two is a purpose-driven life. People are still interested to hear about Jesus. Do you know the number one grossing movie of all time on the release date is still The Passion of the Christ. The whole world is still interested to gather around to hear what we have to say about Jesus. He still draws crowds. He drew crowds when he's walking around. In fact, he drew so many crowds they would they almost crush him. He'd have to escape and run for it. He'd have to slip out in the middle of the night. They would track him down. They would, it wasn't like they had vehicles. They walked for days and days and they would follow him so long that they'd get to places where they didn't even have food. Because they were so enamored by some of the things he was saying. But Jesus was never interested in having a large fan base. He was interested in having some followers. John, the book of John in chapter 6. I'm going to look at it for a couple minutes. I want to introduce it to you real quick. It's a very powerful passage of Scripture. In John chapter 6, this has got it. The, the background is Jesus has got this fan base and there, there are crowds coming around and, and eventually they, they're not leaving and they get hungry. And so, so Jesus, he feeds them and he takes this, this little boy's happy meal and he turns it into thousands of happy meals. And people are pretty excited. And they're pretty jazzed about this Jesus and what he's doing for them and how he's feeding them. And they're getting in their mind, this is great, we just need to stay close to this guy. We stay close to him and he's going to heal us, he's going to fix us, he's going to feed us. This is amazing, this is just what we need, this is all I need. I don't need to work anymore, I just follow Jesus around and he'll fix everything. And so he's got quite a big fan base going. And so the next morning, the disciples and him decide to try to get away. And hide and, and the crowd gets up and they're, they're face stalking him and so they're, they're trying to figure out where he went and some of them were tracking the disciples and they figured out where the disciples went so they went to find them and Jesus wasn't there and, and eventually they track him down. And it says, ah, we found him. And the disciples found him and they're all relieved. Oh, whew, that's good. Now we're all okay again. Jesus is going to fix everything we need. And Jesus replies to them in verse 26. The truth is, you want to be with me because I fed you. 
What a powerful statement. The truth is, you're following me around. The truth is, you just want to be around me because you think I'm going to make things better for you. Because I'm feeding you. Because I'm meeting your needs. And so they, they reply in verse 28, well, what does God want us to do? He said, this is what God wants you to do. Trust in me. Believe in me. Believe that I am the one he sent. That I am life. You know what they replied in verse 30? Then show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What will you do for us? And then they started comparing him to Moses and they said, you know what Moses did? I mean, he, he, fed, he fed the people that followed him for 40 years. He gave them manna in the desert. He, he met their needs. They followed him and he looked after them. So if you're, if you're greater, if you're better than Moses, if that's what you're saying, then, then what are you going to do? Give us his bread. Give us our needs. Meet him. And they said, give us that bread every day of our lives. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And they said, okay, give us more. You said, you're not getting it. It's me that you need. And he says something totally bizarre to kind of throw him off. He goes, so I'm the bread of life. So if you need something to eat, you got to eat my flesh. You got to drink my blood. I'm it. I'm the one that satisfies you. And they're like, excuse me? This guy was really cool until then. And they all start murmuring. And, and he says this. Yes. 48, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. They all died. Yeah, they saw a miracle of God for 40 years. Yeah, they ate the manna. Yes, their needs were met, but guess what? In the end, they still died. And you know what? Everyone that Jesus healed eventually still died. And they died of something. Jesus says, you don't, you got to get focused. you got to get off focus of what I can do for you here. That's not what my message is about. You're following me around because you think I'm here to make your life better and fix things and feed you and look after you, but you're short-sighted. This is not what it's about. You need me because I will bring you life beyond this life. You will still die if I touch you. You will still die if I heal you. You will still die if I feed you. Unless you take me. He turns, the, the crowd's disturbed, frustrated. So there's no food, you can just hear him asking. So he's not feeding us today? Is that what he's trying to say? That sounds like it. All right, we better head home. Literally, so they all murmured to each other and trying to figure out, well, I guess the gravy train's over, I, I don't know. And they all leave, and Jesus turns to his disciples. It says at, in 66, it says, at, many, at, at this point, many of the disciples turned away, and they deserted him. And Jesus turned to his twelve, and he said, are you going to or not? Today is one of those days where it's DTR, day in your relationship. If you don't know what that means, you've been out dating for a while. Define the relationship day. Let's define the relationship. What is really going on here? Are we like exclusive? Are we just friends? Are we just dating? You've been through those talks at one point at least. They're frustrating talks. They're scary for most guys. Like, (sighs) well, that's kind of what Jesus is doing. He's like, just define the relationship here. Are you here because I'm feeding you? Or are you here because you actually are here for me? And he turns to his disciples and says, now what about you? And so he asks these questions to his disciples often. First question is really easy to answer. Who do people say I am? Oh, well, some are saying this, and some are saying that, and some are saying this. And the question for you is, who do people say that Jesus is? Who does Crossroads say that Jesus is? And you could answer it, and you could rattle it off and say, oh, they think this, and they believe this, and they want us to give life, and they believe Jesus uh, came to forgive our sins, and He accepts us no matter where we are, and you'd be all right. And then Jesus is going to turn to you today and define the relationship and say, now, who do you say I am? What does your life say I am? How am I penetrating into your life? Am I penetrating into your life? 
Are you here because you think it's going to be better for you? Are you here because I answer prayer for you? Are you here because you're hoping that your financial situation will get better or your relationships will come together? Because what happens when Jesus says, No! I'm not doing that. It's me. I want you to want me. Yeah, I fed you. Yeah, I've answered prayer, but... The question is defined relationship, but what are you in this for? What is your faith based in? Is it based on that I'm going to make everything here better for you? Or is it based on the person of Jesus Christ? Am I enough for you? Or do I have to keep feeding you every day? There's coming a time in your life, and it may be here, it may be now, when Jesus has not been answering, He's not been providing, and things are crumbling, and you're looking around and He's saying... So am I enough? Is it, was it me you were in this for? Or what I could do for you? And the amazing thing, and this is so true in my own life, it's actually the gifts of God. It's the blessings of God that actually become the biggest stumbling blocks to relationship with God. Because I start to get distracted by them. And I start to seek them and desire them more. And I want more what God can do for me and more of that good feeling. And so I'll run from service to service trying to get that back and keep that feeling alive. Jesus says, am I going to be enough for you? The parable of the soil, the shallow soil, is how far has Jesus penetrated your life? Because if we're keeping him at the service, then when the sun comes, when he has to say no, when he doesn't meet your needs, when he doesn't make you better, when loved ones die, when things happen where Jesus didn't perform the miracle, and that's what you were in it for, that is going to scorch you. And you're going to fade away, and you're going to say, I guess this Christian thing doesn't work. So what's the so what for us? What's the so what for me? The so what is, am I allowing the word, the living word, the encounter of Jesus Christ, when he comes into my room, when he comes into an area of my life and he begins to take his place of light and he shines his light in my room and when he shines it on something and he exposes it for what it is, Do I allow Him to penetrate it? Do I let Him expose it and change it? Or do I get a basket and a bowl and try to cover it up? Am I going to let Him get down deep and let His roots go to my very life? So the question that you can ask yourself, and I need to ask myself on a regular basis, is, has Jesus been allowed to interrupt my life lately? When's the last time he stopped me in my tracks and exposed something? And I listened. And he knew I listened because it created a change of behavior. When's the last time? When's the last time you were at work? When's the last time you were with your friends? When's the last time you were doing your hobby? When's the last time you were out? When Jesus interrupted the scene and you paused it and you could see in this scene, Jesus was there and he made a difference in your life. We need to look at the different areas of our life and we need to pause it and say, is Jesus here? How has it changed? How is this part of my life different? Because he is present. Every person that Jesus interacted with in the flesh was radically changed. Jesus didn't encounter people without rocking their world. The question that I need to ask myself often is when Jesus shows up, when he gives me his word, when he encounters, when I encounter his presence, do I let it penetrate or do I keep it at the top? If we want to become a church that gives life and produces fruit in our community, then we're going to have to let the presence of Jesus break into our lives. And He is gracious and He's slow um, to anger and He's compassionate. And, and I see myself in this soil all the time. And it's so easy to get caught up in what the, He can do for us. 
and the amazing blessings that he can bring. But am I exposing myself to his presence on a regular basis and allowing him to call the shots and interrupting my day? I want to pray for you, pray for myself, I want to pray for our staff, and pray for our church. That we would become the kind of people that wouldn't keep Jesus under a basket or in the corner or, or just leave him at the surface. That we become a people that he could penetrate to produce an amazing harvest in central Alberta. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you that you are gracious, you are compassion. I thank you for the gift of your word in our lives. That you're a living God. That, that this isn't a script that we just read. This isn't just something to put on our walls. This isn't just something to memorize. But that you are alive in the person. You're in a personal relationship with us. That you want to bring us into your family. That you want us to taste you. That we might have life forever with you. Heavenly Father, help us not to get distracted by the things that come and they go. Heavenly Father, we pray as a church that we would be marked by your presence. That we wouldn't just simply be hearers of your word, but we would be doers of your word as well. Heavenly Father, would you penetrate us with your light? Would you expose what you need to expose that we might be changed and transformed? Heavenly Father, it's not always a good time when you expose stuff. My own life is just painful. But we thank you for your grace and your mercy and how you create change and bring life. The seed dies and brings forth life. That is you. Heavenly Father, may we understand you more. 